a lot of DMing advice is about focusing on the narrative, the storytelling aspect of the game. And there's even more advice on the mechanics, about how to master the rules. But there's another aspect of running the game that I like just as much. Back in the dark days of tabletop RPGs, a period called the late 90s, there arose a theory. Well, not really so much a theory as a series of articles and essays that really tried to articulate what were the essential facets of RPG play. What later became called GNS really tried to qualify what were the essential elements that made up role-playing games. Gamism, narrativism, and simulationist. At its heart, GNS argues that these three things, these three creative agendas, are what make RPGs fun. They are the why of why people play. Gamism is competition and challenge. It's, can my character survive the peril? Can I get the most gold? Or from a DM's point of view, gamism can be something like, can I build a challenging yet legal encounter? It's about victory and using the rules and system to achieve it. Fourth edition can be considered a very gamist heavy game. Narrativism is the desire to tell a dramatic story. Not just an exciting story, but a story that has structure. It has three acts, character arcs, and literary themes. It's about the emotional satisfaction driven through storytelling. Critical Role can be considered a really narrativist heavy game. This video is about the last, simulationism. If gameism is rules driven and narrativism is character driven, simulationist is setting driven. It's world and genre driven. You can play a single soldier war game or a monster fighting game that will 100% fulfill a gamist's desires. Or just a storytelling or improv exercise could fulfill a narrativist's agenda. A pure simulationist exercise is world building for the sake of world building. Eventually the GNS idea of strictly three mutually exclusive ways to have fun fell out of favor for reasons but I still think it's a useful way to look at player preferences. And almost uniquely, GNS gives us a way to look at player preferences that include the DM as a player. So it's also a way we can look at DMing styles or different ways to incorporate ideas into the game. Because this channel focuses a lot on what I would consider like gamist or narrativist ideas, I thought it'd be fun to do a video on simulationism in D&D. And I think there are two main ideas that we want to explore. Simulationism as objectiveness and as emulation. And unlike a lot of my other videos, I'm not gonna try to argue in favor of one particular method. I'm not gonna try to say there's any real virtue in any particular style of play. This vid is more informational, just simulationism as something to be aware of. And like most good forms of critical review, GNS gives us a framework. It gives us a tool with which we can look at different DMing styles. But at the end of the video, I am gonna give you some ideas of how I use simulationism in my game. There is a lot of joy to be found in playing the watchmaker, constructing a world and then just letting it run. A simulationist heavy DM's game is designed to simulate a thriving interactive ecosystem for the players to be immersed in. To get everyone to feel like their player characters are just present in a world that extends and exists independently of them. Civilizations crash and legends rise and fall, even if the players are off screen. Like The Sims, the NPCs will go on existing even if the players never interact with them. Because the players are just one part of this dynamic, interactive world, simulationist play tends to put a lot of emphasis on exploring the breadth and depth of a setting and its denizens. And importantly, also exploring the logic of the world, the hows and whys of the setting. DMs build a framework and players explore the workings of it. You make a world that contains a kind of logic and natural laws that are understandable and, if not predictable, at least knowable. This style of DMing really delights players who like to explore, to poke things and see how they react. And having a reliable understanding of the internal rules of the world really gives this player the environment they need to thrive. They overcome challenges not based on solving an arbitrary puzzle in the mechanics, but instead on their understanding of the workings of the world. Simulationism prioritizes following the intent of the design structure. The player's interactions with the imaginary features of the world are systemic. They are a byproduct of the world doing its thing, rather than being directed or intentionally constructed just for the players. The outcomes of those interactions are the organic consequences of the world responding in compliance with the rules you've laid out. Simulationism also values internal consistency over any metagame aspect. 
And this is one of the benefits of 5e's bounded accuracy system, that low-level baddies, orcs, goblins, and such can still be used at higher levels. You don't suddenly have your world filled only with high CR monsters at the character's rise in level. It's like, where were all these guys a few months ago? Like, if every orc is now a level CR 13 orc chief, why are they just overrunning every single village? Within the structure of 5e, bands of hobgoblins can coherently coexist with a party throughout their adventuring career. And if the map says, here be dragons, well, there be dragons there from levels 1 to 20. It's important to note that eschewing metagame aspects goes beyond things like, do we have a healer, or is this encounter balanced? Because it also includes story-centric aspects, like, does my character have a good flaw? After all, people in Fantasyland don't go around wondering, am I fulfilling my character arc? Rather, the story elements are derived through another way. Through application of the system, genre-specific stories can emerge, seemingly at random, through the player's interactions with different parts of the game world. The guy who came up with GNS really regretted calling the S simulationism after a while, because he thought people were getting confused with mimicking reality. A better term, he later conceded, would probably be something like emulation. You are trying to achieve a playstyle that has a specific feeling. There are rules in the DNG you can use to heighten this type of play. You can use the structure of 5e to help simulate a specific type of genre. The horror rules help you simulate a horror game and the honor rules let you play in a Bushido campaign where prestige mechanically matters. Or something as simple as leaning into flaws and inspiration can really reinforce a theme. Like the flaw, I can't resist the allure of an attractive person in distress, can really help you emulate the noir genre. In a way, simulationism also focuses on exploring the tone, character types, and tropes of a particular flavor of fantasy as a priority of play. In emulating a genre, you're not simulating our reality, but a reality. And consequently, simulationist play is heavily concerned with keeping the internal logic and consistency while exploring that genre. But I also want to point out that a simulationist focus isn't just on background or genre lore. There's a variety of other things that you can simulate. You can simulate a situation where a gamer's point of view would be, what's the winning outcome? Or a narrative's point of view would be, what is the dramatic outcome? A simulation's point of view would be, what is the most likely outcome? Knowing the world building rules, what is most likely to happen in this scenario? Or a character. A gamer's point of view might be a mechanically interesting concept, or to engineer a fantastically powerful character. A narrative's point of view might be similar to, can we make a character with a cool background or an interesting story? But a simulationist point of view is more akin to method acting. It's what does it feel like to be a person in this setting? Now, like I said, I'm not advocating that everyone adopt a 100% simulationist point of view for their game. But what I am saying is this is an interesting way to look at which things are worth approaching with a simulationist mindset versus which things are better left with a gamist or narrativist mindset. I love abstract hit points for the gameism it allows and I rarely track rations or ammunition, unless tracking those things is really specific to the type of story I'm trying to tell. And I'm also pretty hand wavy with magical components. Why? Because I think it helps you tell a more real feeling story. I mean, after all, how many a thousand gold piece gem encrusted bowls do you think there actually are in the world? So every time the heroes want to cast Heroes Feast, they either have to go to a merchant, which always has it, which is crazy, or they have to go on their own little distracting mini quest just to cast the spell. So in this case, ignoring the simulationism actually produces a more real feeling and logical world. It's also the reason why I keep gold and magic levels generally low. It is easier to create a world with consistent rules that withstand scrutiny. And I use this phrase a lot, but I hate absurdity bombs. And in my opinion, the more high powered magic you put in your game, the more likely it is that you put something in your fantasy world that on the surface seems okay, but on closer examination becomes laughably illogical. So in practice, compromises should be made. And I think a good compromise between a simulationist and a gamist narrative point of view is to have dynamic dungeons and a static campaign. Now, here's what I mean by this. A strict simulationist would track the party's movement round by round throughout the dungeon to see exactly how long it took them to reach the final chamber to clear out the cultist lair. But it's exciting to arrive at the final chamber just in the nick of time to stop the sacrifice. 99% of the time, that is more fun than finding the victim already dead or having them locked in the cage because you speed ran the dungeon. So rather than strict realism for your dungeons, I recommend creating some dynamic elements that will respond with logical consequences for your player's decisions. What I did in the City of Zir adventure 
was if the players take the main route through the dungeon, they arrive in the sanctuary with three rounds until the ritual is finished. But if they sneak ahead to the boss chamber, they arrive with five rounds to spare. Obviously, bypassing a good chunk of the dungeon is going to save them more than 12 seconds of time, but it still serves the purpose of simulating the effect of the players getting there early. But in the wider campaign, I tend to be more static in how things unfold. I keep a running calendar of how many days have passed and how many days until a major plot point reaches a critical event. Those events will happen with or without the player's involvement. Experience points also create this feeling of objectiveness. There are rules to the world and the players progress by following these rules. It's not the DM's arbitrary metagame decision of how far these particular players have advanced the adventure, because that's only specific to them. It's not a simulation of a wider world. And on that note about XP, about simulationism, I don't really balance encounters either. Yeah, no one goes up that mountain because there's a troll there, but you're welcome to try first level party. Not every encounter can or should be able to be won, or be balanced, or be fair. The flip side of that is powerful characters sometimes get to slaughter low level minions and they feel really strong. It's an effect, they, they feel more powerful because they've earned their place. If you want to try and wander into the wilds to find a dragon, go ahead. But as a DM, I'm not going to stop you from trying to get that treasure and maybe getting roasted in the process. If you want to assassinate the Duke, go ahead, but expect the world to react accordingly. And to be perfectly honest, this sort of style of DMing can sometimes be a source of tension between the players and the DMs. Some players you know, can reasonably expect that the world will scale with them, but that's not the game I run, so I have to tell people that. But there is a point to this. I know that not balancing encounters is really leading to a real feeling world when the players say something like, oh, it's a good thing we didn't come here earlier, we would have been killed. And that is how I know it's working, that they're really buying into the simulated reality that I created. And that's what DMing is all about. Yeah, that's it. That's the video, folks. This was a pretty interesting one, I thought. There's not a lot of people talking about GNS theory anymore, and not a lot of people talking about simulationism in games. So if you have some ideas about the three types of creative agendas, if there are even three, if you have some thoughts about simulationism or how to emulate a specific genre, there's a really great comment section. People are always putting really thoughtful stuff down there, really little toxicity, and I respond to almost everything. So go ahead and let me know in the uh, comments below. If you want to know what's happening with the Galder project, I posted a link to the subreddit with my current thoughts in the description.